we're we're pretty much any location that you can name where where there's good business going on, we will have a TMF office there. We we've got very good coverage. Okay. So uh, one thing that I would like to discuss is uh, annually TMF Group we mm. compile this uh, TMF Global Business Complexity Index mm. uh, GBCI, and mm. this ranks all of the mm. jurisdictions we're in by complexity for doing business. Um, uh, how long does it take to set up a company? How mm. Easy is it to uh, hire or fire staff? What are the mm. labor law protection like? And uh, a number of these other metrics to, to rank the, the complexity mm. or the relative ease mm. of doing business. And we released this earlier, um, just I think last month. And mm. uh, we can also provide um, a copy of this to mm. you. Uh, and I'll really be discussing Singapore's relative position on that. and. Uh, its strengths and, and areas where you need to be careful of, right? Mm. Yep. So if you look at APAC, um, these, these numbers are the global numbers or the global mm. rankings, right? Yep. But looking at APAC itself, the most complex jurisdictions in the world were, and APAC, sorry, APAC were Indonesia, China, and mm. Malaysia. Mm. Indonesia also has the dubious distinction of being the most complex in the okay. world, not just APAC. It's, it's number mm -hmm. one out of 77 countries right. for, for being the most complex to do business. Okay. Um, in terms of the least complex uh, in Asia, uh, Hong Kong was first and it's ranked 12 worldwide, mm -hmm. okay. uh, followed by Singapore at 18 and then New okay. Zealand at 19. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, some reasons for that, right? Well, let me focus on, th does anyone have any questions so far? If you do have questions, you can raise your hand or we can discuss. Any questions? Yeah. None so far. Okay. None so far. Okay. All right. All right. And, and there's various reasons for this. Um, which yeah. hopefully I'll go, I'll go through during the, the, the rest of the presentation. Okay. So Singapore complexity ranking is the 18th simplest globally and the second simplest jurisdiction in APAC. And when we were drilling down, we, we did it across three specific focus areas, the accounting and tax, human hmm. resources and payroll, as well All as right. rules, regulations and penalties. Okay. If we look first at the accounting and tax considerations, what makes... Singapore desirable in this spec. Hmm. So the local accounting standards, Singapore SFRS, Singapore Financial Reporting Standards, is basically okay. in full alignment with IFRS. Hmm. So if you're an international company and you're IFRS compliant, you shouldn't have any worries about local variations here, right, hmm. for Singapore. Yep. The tax rate in Singapore is also very, very competitive. It's got a corporate tax rate of only 17%. And it's got double taxation agreements with over 80 countries worldwide. Mm. So very friendly, very easy to do business and mm. very internationally recognized. All right. Um, when you talk about the actual logistics and the mechanics, if you have a company in Singapore, mm. the Singapore government is very keen on its digitization efforts. So yep. a lot of the filing submissions, uh, they can all be online. Um, and they've taken steps from the initial rollout to actually simplify and reduce the level of information required um, mm -hmm. for these filings, right? And, and, and there are all these other ongoing digitization efforts for nationwide e-invoicing and other stuff. Mm -hmm. It's been particularly relevant um, during the current circumstances of, of mm -hmm. COVID, right? Because if you compare this with some of the other jurisdictions, mm -hmm that require manual filings on paper, wet signatures, okay. right? When, when we're all on lockdown or remote work from home, it's, it can make business very, very challenging. So this is one of the key strengths of mm. the Singapore jurisdiction. Okay. One area of relative complexity that you need to be aware of, um, mm. it's, it's not quite unique to Singapore, but it is kind of a worldwide trend, mm. is increases in debts. 
um, monitoring and scrutiny from the mm. OECD to combat, you know, um, negative tax practices, tax evasion yeah. and other stuff. So mm. it is a signatory member and it, it has joined it. So, so things like controller registers, uh, talking about UBOs, which, which is actually on the next slide is, is something that, that people are cognizant of. Okay. The Singapore government, again, is, is very, very business friendly and it tries to do things in as easy as way as possible. Um, uh, even though there's four official languages in Singapore, mm. English, Chinese, Tamil, and Malay, all business, mm. all interactions with the government are all in English. Mm. Again, this common language of global worldwide business, so it facilitates operation. Mm. If you look at some of the other jurisdictions, Indonesia, Japan, China, mm. Malaysia, a lot of the government interactions and, mm. and business contracts have to be in the local native language, right? So that, yep. that, that's, that's an added dimension of complexity for, for multinational companies, yeah, but something that which you do not need to worry about um, in mm. Singapore. Mm. Singapore's laws itself, um, Paul will be talking more about this later, but it's based upon a common law framework okay. as opposed to a civil law framework in, in China. So it's transparency, consistency, precedent, mm. right? There's something that you can rely on and you can kind of know what's going to happen uh, to the extent that you can know anything's mm. going to happen when there's a legal dispute. Mm. Mm. Uh, the Singapore government has also encouraged, is also encouraging a lot of mm. foreign investment, particularly for fund asset managers. Mm. Earlier this year, it created a new incorporation structure called um, a variable capital company to attract uh, fund managers to the region. And it simplifies the administrative procedures for a lot of fund managers. I'm not mm. sure if we have any fund managers on today, but things like distributions uh, out of capital, um, increasing mm. capital injections, repatriations, mm. all of those procedures have been streamlined under, under a VCC. And it also mm. allows the creation of of various sub funds which mm. uh, have legal separation, so it's so it's so it's kind of a game changer in Singapore mm. at least for for fund asset managers to make their lives a lot easier and mm. um, attract funds to to the country. Okay. Similar to what I mentioned with the tax, um, the uh, government agencies, uh, ACRA, which which regulates you know your annual corporate returns, shareholders, mm. um, and all those registers, mm. all of that is online. And the beauty okay. of the Singapore government system is that it's using a core pass, which is basically a single identity or login mm. um, that is common across all of the government platforms. So you don't need to, yep. oh, what's my IRS identity? What's my ACRA identity? It's, you have this one thing that, mm. uh, that is used across all the systems to, yep. uh, to facilitate uh, communication mm. back and forth with the government and all the filings. Yep. Right. Um, E-signatures, very, very uh, widely accepted here in Singapore, with a few limited exceptions um, for property, financial instruments, and trusts, mm. but those are also being revisited. Mm. So very, very easy. I mean, it, it really highlighted this when, you, when we were trying to work from home here in Singapore versus yep. some of the other jurisdictions. Mm. Some of them, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, China, they use something historical called like the company chop where they really uh, yep. have to have the wet signatures plus this, this company stamp mm. to process official documentation. And, and that's been done away. Like you don't have that in Singapore. Mm. So you don't need those, those type of wet signatures or chops. Oh. But I do understand that just a question. Uh, I do understand there are some companies that do have e chops. Is that yes. acceptable with or without it's fine. Is it? Yeah. Are you talking about Singapore or are you talking about yeah, the other jurisdictions? Singapore, here. Singapore, yeah. Singapore, I mean, it's like since I've been here, again, it's only six months, mm. but we've never seen e chops. We've seen a lot of e signatures, mm. right? Digital scans and, yep. and, and other e signature um, uh, solutions. But I've never, like, in general, you don't need a chop unless I think your company's constitution says a document is only authorized if you use that chop. I see. Right. So it's not, it's definitely not something that would be imposed by the, by the, by the government or common practice within the market. Okay. Thank you. Yes. 
uh, in terms of complexity or areas where you have to be careful of, uh, ACRA, mm. the Accounting Regulatory Authority, they've been stepping up some of their enforcement actions on companies just to make sure that they are in mm. compliance, that mm. filings are met, uh, deadlines are adhered to. Okay. Right. And the Singapore government, it, it publicizes this. It's, has, it adopts something of a name and shame policy. Mm. So if you find yourself on the wrong side, if you have breached, um, the general approach of the Singapore government is that they feel as if they can't go after everyone. So the people that they do catch, they have a tendency to make examples of. So you need to make sure that you adhere to these, to these things and, and don't get on the wrong side. Mm. Right? Um, there is also a new Payment Services Act that was introduced this year. This oh. was really for crypto, Bitcoin, or, or other things, but a lot of other people also got caught up. Oh. Um, and it's about uh, an increased level of regulation over payment services, mm. uh, especially using the electronic forms in light of all the innovations that are happening. But, but yep. the purpose of this was, was to actually enhance cus- consumer protection and engender confidence in the new e-payment. So it's not being difficult for the sake of being difficult, but it's, but it's trying to boost confidence and improve the acceptability of those type of payment platforms. Mm. Okay. Uh, the third dimension, HR and payroll considerations. The uh, employment laws in, in Singapore, I would say are respectable they 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 imply they give a fairly high level of employee protection but they're not unfairly weighted in the favor of the employees um so so i think it has struck an appropriate balance right uh the government is very keen to promote understanding of this so there's a wealth of knowledge available um uh government statements uh ministry of manpower uh, discussing regulations. And of course, you can always talk to us in TMF to, to help you guide those through those as well. The uh, retirement age is also being lifted to expand the availability of the workforce pool, uh, moving from 60 to 65, and then what they call the, the re-employment age. So even after retirement, you can still continue to extend contracts on a yearly basis, right? Yep. Uh, I think one of the best ways the business friendliness and the welcome nature of the Singapore government was embodied was its in its response to COVID. Over the course of the COVID-19 situation, the mm-hmm. government has issued four um, budgetary pronouncements, solidarity, fortitude, resilience, um, and unity mm-hmm. to assist companies in this. Um, topping up schemes and, and providing support to, to individuals. There's personal stuff to Singapore citizens and PRs, but also to corporations. And the most significant scheme, the job support scheme, which provides a 25 to 75% subsidy of your, of your local workers, that required no additional filings. It used the uh, statutory submissions that you're doing anyway for um, the provident fund submissions to calculate your subsidy and give it to you. So corporations, they didn't need to do anything special, fill in a form Mm -hmm. or do anything to get that. It it just kind of sat there and and, and the subsidies would come in. Obviously we assisted clients in with doing cash flow forecasts and how much they can expect, what are the rules and explaining it because the calculations were complicated. Mm -hmm. But in terms of what they actually had to do um, to secure those subsidies, it was not much. Other than the local mm. workers, they've given foreign levy rebates um, and, and other things um, to, to support the, the foreign workers. And so it was, mm. I, I was very, very impressed um, by the Singapore government's response to this. Mm. Um, areas of relative complexity, when you think about Singapore, is uh those that provident funds the cpf as it's referred to it does have different rates depending upon the class of worker the age of the worker right and the sector so it's not a universal flat rate and it can vary so Mm. so so that is something to be aware of and obviously we help with those calculations right foreign workers as well are regulated through quotas and levies 
although there've the, uh, been a series of these of these waivers and rebates in light of the covid situation okay right yeah so so very impressive there yeah and then if we talk about singapore overall why do i yeah. think it's it's such a good location um it's a strategic location right for anyone looking mm. to expand into the region very attractive um regional and international financial center okay the government is incredibly business friendly and always welcomes investment mm. and has many initiatives support programs and other things to to assist companies setting up in the region tax rate is very competitive and it's got the strong network of international trade agreements mm. When you talk about the standard of living and the ease of expat integration, it's it's a very desirable location. So it's mm. very it's very easy to harness talent from multiple jurisdictions, not just the local Singapore workforce, but mm. other people relocating into the region. It, mm. It's a popular destination in that sense, right? Mm. In terms of the local workforce, very educated, highly skilled. And a major and and one of the key unique factors is a majority of which have native fluency in both English as well as Mandarin. Okay. So, 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 so very easy to to do business and obviously it doesn't have the geographical closeness to to mm. China, but in terms of the language skills, that that is all there, right? Mm. Um, and then lastly, it's a bit of a sensitive topic, but. Um, it enjoys a very stable social political environment, right? Mm. Uh, a stance of geopolitical neutrality when it comes to the affairs of of other countries, and it goes out of its way to to avoid trouble or getting caught up in in some of the other geopolitical disputes that are happening around the region, mm. right? So very stable. The laws, everything else makes makes it a very very favorable place um, to mm. be. Okay. Thank you. Um, that's that's about it for, for the formal presentation and, and the overview. But I, I would welcome any questions that, that people might have on this, or if you want to save that to the Q and A session at the end. Yeah. Any questions for Edmund in regards to uh, the uh, on the corporate secretarial contacts or any regulations uh, in Singapore? And no. Okay. Uh, well, we'll... Right. I I, have, I do have one, uh, uh, Edmund. Uh, mm. So, do you think Singapore uh, and digital trade so, uh, comparative to where you were in Hong Kong, which is a very vibrant city? Uh, what are comparatives uh, if we talk about digital trades or we talk about the uh, the the COSEC, um, function? I and uh, how 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 do you? What's your opinion on that? Is Singapore better or? Um, yeah, I think it's <laughs> for you. <laughs> Bet, uh, better, better is uh, is a very um, difficult thing to say because mm. it's it, it involves a uh, a level of of bias or or judgment. Mm. I can say so. So if you look back at at some of the reasons, uh, often I get asked questions on is Sing Hong Kong better than Singapore as a result mm. of this ranking, and I and I say that is a value judgment. Mm. But what I can say is that there are differences in the in the complexities involved, right? Mm. So if you look at the Singapore company secretarial rules, mm. um, local comp like uh, companies here, they're required to have at least one local mm. resident director, right? You need to have somebody physically present in Singapore, a, a local PR or a Singapore citizen yep. that attaches their name to to the Singapore company so that they can find someone responsible. Mm. Conversely, in a, in a jurisdiction like Hong Kong, you, you don't have that. All of the directors can be overseas, right? Some jurisdictions, Philippines, Ruel, you, you might be aware, it used to have a requirement for five, five <laughs> local <you> know, <laughs> resident directors. It, it's changed now and it's been reduced to two, right? Okay. But it's all, it's all kind of relative in, in, terms of, in terms of those requirements, right? Okay. Um, so, so uh, again, there's a rationale for it. The Singapore government mm. wants to make sure that if, if something happens with the company, there is someone locally that can yeah. take responsibility and they're not just going to abscond and, uh, and others. So there is reasons behind it. But if you mm. look at some of the others, it's, it's, it's a lot more extreme in terms of the, 
in, in terms of the director representation requirements. India, for example, it's not just the directors, but also the hmm. ownerships. Oh, There's it? a negative um, investment wow. list mandating, you know, local ownership percentages that are required for, mm. for, for certain industries. Okay. Hopefully that addresses some part of you. I, I didn't really go <laughs> too much into the digitization, but, but just uh, relative um, yeah. comparisons yeah. there. I think it's good. So, thank you. So if there are no questions, any questions further? Uh, thank you, Anvin. Okay. Thank you, thank you Ralph. All right, so, okay, if there's no question, uh, we will proceed with the next speaker. Let me do a quick introduction of him. Okay, we do have some uh, lawyers in place uh, today, uh, in, in, which is one of our participants, I think a couple of it. So Paul is a partner with Raja and Tan Singapore. Uh, he's in the Singapore Regional Coordination Group. So I think uh, he has been uh, many years in the legal career. And he started practices as a litigation lawyer, specializing in insolvency, restructuring, and banking litigation. All right, subsequently, Paul spent uh, four years in Jakarta, okay, which is the most complex city that uh, Edmund mentioned earlier, to facilitate the expansion of the project. So uh, when you, I think when you are involved in the very uh, complex environment, uh, you would know how to... Uh, uh, no, 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 the, I think the easy way out is easier then, okay? For uh, example, like Hong Kong and Singapore, and uh, it will be a uh, very good uh, facilitation of uh, legal advisory. So by way of an, he, he also affiliated with the Indonesian law firm, uh, okay? And uh, during his time in Indonesia, uh, he's also engaged in cross-border dispute, well, okay? As well as corporate commercial matters. So Paul returned to Singapore recently, and uh, four years ago, and then he is actually managing MNC clients uh, in Singapore uh, and advising on their legal matters and also uh, for startups uh, regions. So uh, let us welcome Paul. All right. Thank you. So Paul, over to you. Thank you, Christine. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for taking the time um, to actually attend this webinar. And of course, thank you to, to Talent Viz for actually facilitating and organizing this. Um, without further ado, I'm just going to jump straight into my presentation. So let me get it on. Um, <laughs> okay. Yes, I was having some technical difficulties just now, but hopefully that has been resolved. Sure. Okay. Take our time. All right, I can see your screen now. Right. Okay, is that fine, Christine? Yep, yep. And everyone else? Sure. Okay, um, yeah, so, so let me just launch um, uh, this presentation with a very quick uh, introduction. Can, can enlarge a little bit more? Uh, uh, unfortunately not, because mm -hmm. it's actually launching from Google Drive. Okay. Uh, but, but if there's anybody who, who needs a copy of the presentation after this, of course, as usual, uh, would be happy to 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 circulate it via talent this. So um, without further ado, maybe I'll just jump straight into a quick introduction of of Raja Antan sure. for those of you who are not familiar with us. Um, Ra Raja Antan Asia Network. Let me just go straight to this. Yeah. Um, basically, the Raja Antan Asia Network is the largest network of law firms in the ASEAN region. So we, we have our own dedicated offices throughout the region, um, except for two countries in ASEAN, and that would be Brunei and, and Timor. Mm. Yeah. Um, other than that, we actually have physical offices. Um, in addition to that, we, we also have a office, a rep office in China, um, dedicated to assisting our, our mainland Chinese clients. Mm. Um, we also have a Japan desk, which sits out of Singapore, but is staffed with um, Japanese lawyers. And in addition to that, we've recently set up a Brunei desk. Uh, mm. Not no physical office in Brunei, but okay. we we essentially help clients uh, through Singapore. So that's a Raja and Chan Asian network. Yep. Um, we also have got two subsidiaries. Uh, one of which is Rajantan Technologies. Um, so for those of you here who are in the 
uh, startup market. Um, mm. We actually started Raja Antan Technologies a few years back, um, mm. but it's only ramped up uh, about this year and a half past. Mm. So essentially what R&T Tech does is to, um, is to digitize and, and uh, make, well, make a far more advanced platform by which to access legal solutions. So when I say that, it means things like um, when you go to court, you need to do discovery of documents. Mm. Um, we have an electronic platform by which to, to assist in that process. So in the past, what you used to have to do is to basically have like, if you have a big case, you have a large team of lawyers basically sifting through documents. And that takes hours and hours, if not months and months to basically do. Um, essentially, with these text and solutions, what you do is you scan in all the relevant docs. Um, it goes through a process where the relevant documents are sorted out from those not relevant. Um, basically, it saves both the lawyers as well as, more importantly, the yeah. clients a lot of time. And as all of you know here, since uh, lawyers traditionally charge by a time-based model, <laughs> savings of time will, will result in, in lower costs. Um, we also have R&T Asia Resources, which um, in a nutshell, basically, we, we help clients to, to procure um, contract lawyers to help them for short-term legal needs. Um, so that, that is a very quick summary of the Raja Antan Asia Network. So having done that, maybe I'll just jump straight into the presentation itself. Hmm. Right. So um, what we have, uh, what I, I hope to not overlap with Edmund's presentation too much, um, but essentially I will be focusing more on perhaps uh, some incorporation 101 matters uh, from the Singapore perspective, Singapore okay. legal perspective. But before that, let me just jump into the ASEAN business environment. And this is where there will be a bit of overlap with, with uh, Edmund's presentation. Okay. Um, so what, what we've done is we've relied on the World Bank's ease of doing business score. And as okay. you can see, um, mm. in that particular ranking, Singapore in the ASEAN region is ranked on top. And, uh, right. and, and of course, uh, after that, you've got a whole series of rankings for the other uh, ASEAN jurisdictions. Mm. Yeah. So, as far as Singapore is concerned, and I don't propose to spend too much time on this, Edmund having already covered it. Um, essentially, from a legal perspective, mm. um, Singapore has taken a lot of effort to basically uh, market itself and make it. <clears throat> as attractive to foreign investors as possible. Okay. So when I say that, you know, leaving aside the developed city point, um, mm -hmm. the second point on that slide, the little or no barriers to entry. And I think that's relevant because what Edmund mentioned just now is the presence mm -hmm. of a negative um, investment list. Mm -hmm. So for the benefit of those of you who are not um, familiar with this concept, Singapore basically, the position is that Companies in general can do, can undertake any form of business mm. unless there's specific legislation to, to impose specific requirements or licenses. So, mm. for example, um, finance or insurance come to mind. But other than that, even in, in the constitution of Singapore companies, um, unless you specify a specific line of business in the constitution, the underlying assumption is that basically the company can do any mm. form of business. Mm. Now, um, compare and contrast this with, with let's say, Indonesia. Mm. Yeah? Indonesia still has a negative investment list. Um, although they are now, and, and they've been talking about mm. taking steps to amend it to make it more investment friendly. But okay. as it stands, um, there is a list which basically tries to exhaustively set out a, all the various industries and business sectors and to prescribe whether or not these business sectors are either closed to foreign investment, mm. meaning that it needs to be 100% locally owned, either that or it's fully open, mm. or more often than not, in between, 
you've got a, a whole series of businesses where they prescribe different um, foreign ownership restrictions. Now, now, this is particularly relevant in the context of foreign investors looking into the region um, because evidently foreign investors, as far as possible, mm. they would like to have majority control of whatever entity they set mm. up in, in whatever jurisdiction it may be. Okay. And once you have got um, negative investment lists or foreign ownership restrictions, mm. um, you then need to, as a foreign investor, pay particular attention to, to, uh, to how you go about getting around or complying with these uh, requirements, of course, in a legal manner. Um, this is, again, coming back to Singapore, something that you don't have to worry about in Singapore because, again, it is, is fully open. So, um, uh, so going back to the slide very quickly, as, as Edmund has mentioned, infrastructure-wise, um, I think I can say with, with confidence that as far as infrastructure is concerned, Singapore mm. is, is ahead of the curve as far as this region is concerned. Mm, mm. And also, as, as Edmund mentioned, um, one, of the thing which, one of the things which particularly stands out, mm. uh, especially over this COVID period, is that essentially everything you need to do vis-a-vis -vis the government, the Singapore government, mm. is online. So company incorporations can be done online, your filings can be done online, virtually mm. everything can be done online. Um, compare and contrast this with a lot of uh, other countries. Um, mm. They are taking steps to, of course, try and, and um, improve their digital infrastructure. Mm. But the reality is that when clients come to us um, and they need help in, in countries across the region, there mm. is generally not enough information or not enough resources available online from the various government um, departments and ministries. So what happens more often than not is that our lawyers actually have to either call or pay a visit to the mm. relevant um, ministries or statutory boards and actually have a face-to-face -face consultation with them. Mm. Um, Quite apart from the fact that this is sometimes problematic or, or tedious administratively, mm. um, what we find is that the you know at the end of the day, basically you'll have one officer in whatever ministry it is who is attending to you. Um, and although they do try to have common standards, of course, across the various officers, but the reality is that once you have got a person interposed. Mm. Um, there's always the element of subjectivity. And the difficulty of that is that, you know, if you go and consult the ministry one day, somebody attends to you and he or she tells you A. Um, so you proceed on the basis of A. Yep. And subsequently, when you actually do proceed, Officer B attends to you and tells you something which is different. Yep. And you need to go back to the drawing board, essentially. Um, <laughs> so that's not ideal. So having said that, let me just um, move on. Uh, again, I don't propose to go too much into this. Um, we, we have a, a bit of a variation. Um, according to, to the World Bank, uh, Indonesia actually ranks slightly higher above Philippines. Um, mm. But again, I, I would like to stress that in, in my experience, all mm. the countries around the region are actually taking steps to, to improve. Um, mm. But the fact of the matter I may not be politically correct, but the fact of the matter is that I think Singapore is, is quite ahead of the curve. Mm. Yeah, so having delved into that, let me, let me just go into um, a very quick outline of investing in Singapore. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, okay. The basic structure is that there is no differentiation between domestic and foreign companies. Yeah. Um, this again goes back to Indonesian example. So you've got um, instances where you've got 100% locally owned companies. And the moment um, any foreigner mm. even owns one share in an Indonesian company, then it is deemed as being a foreign owned company. Now, why is this relevant? Um, it is relevant because uh, amongst other factors, the paid up capital requirements varies 
um, mm -hmm. quite significantly between domestic and foreign companies. So obviously to try and um, facilitate uh, uh, domestic companies to set up the, the capital requirements in many countries which differentiate is that there are much lower uh, capital requirements for domestic companies. Mm. On the other hand, for foreign companies, um, in Indonesia, the moment you are deemed as being a foreign-owned company, or, or they, they use this term PTPMA, which I'm sure some of you would have seen um, in the course of your dealings, um, immediately then the foreign-owned company needs to comply with quite significant uh, mm. capital requirements or investment requirements. So, for example, in, in Indonesia, once you are a foreign-owned company, you need to have a investment, there's an investment requirement for, of approximately 1 million Singapore dollars, of which a quarter of that needs to be in the form of paid-up capital. Mm. Um, in my experience, this is particularly relevant for SMEs or for startups, um, because once they hear that, oh, I need to actually put in a quarter of a million in paid up capital and I need to invest one million uh, in, within one year, that is really a significant uh, amount of money to put up when you're, uh, when you're actually just trying your luck uh, in the market. Yeah. Mm. Um, moving on to the next point, there is no differentiation between state and private owned companies. Mm. And uh, there's also a unified tax treatment. Apart from, from this, um, Edmund has also touched into this. Um, as far as the Singapore government is concerned, um, for many years now, there's been a concerted effort to make Singapore very um, foreign investor friendly. Mm. So there's a whole bunch of incentive programs and incentive policies set up by, by the Economic Development Board um, mm. to basically incentivize companies to set up uh, in, in Singapore. And, and more often than not, what this entails is really quite significant tax benefits mm. um, as well as grants from, from the Singapore government. Mm. Mm. Um, I, I believe there will be a subsequent session after this where TalentVis will, will, be, will be inviting perhaps some of our uh, uh, EDB <laughs> friends to basically present, so I won't go too much into this. Okay. Now, moving on. Um, okay. This is not an exhaustive list, but essentially, um, the three main methods to, to start your journey into investing in Singapore um, would be through these three means. Yeah. Number one is to establish a rep office. Mm. Um, very quickly, basically a representative office is, is um, not, not supposed to conduct business. It's more like a, um, uh, shall we say, a, a marketing or, or business research mm. wing of a foreign-owned enterprise. Mm. The, the other way of doing it is to actually set up a company. So mm. um, as I'm sure all of you are aware with that, of course, the advantage is that um, any properly incorporated company can conduct whatever business it wants, as I mentioned earlier. Mm. And of course, there's this separation legally between the shareholders of the company and the company itself. So that, as, as of, of course, as, as you would know, affords the company and its shareholders the, the necessary protection under the law. Um, and the third is to acquire an existing company. Mm. Yeah. So um, I, I mentioned this um, earlier. So very quickly, I'll, I'll just run through these points. So the scope of business for a rep office is to do market research, feasibility, liaison. It's not supposed to carry out sales or revenue generating uh, businesses um, mm -hmm. and also a subject approval by this entity called Enterprise Singapore. Mm. Yeah. As far as um, a company is concerned, these are really, this is just a very quick outline of the basic requirements. You only need a, a minimum of one shareholder, mm. one director who is resident in Singapore. Capital is one, yeah, as I mentioned, one dollar. Um, and of course, you've got your auditor and company secretary requirements. Um, again, compare and contrast this with uh, 
various jurisdictions across the ASEAN region. Um, capital I mentioned earlier, and, and other than Indonesia, there are a few other jurisdictions yeah. where if you have foreign investors, you, you, you basically have a different and, and more onerous or higher capital requirement as compared to a uh, yeah. domestic company. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Now, directors is also another thing. Uh, going back to the Indonesia example, although mm -hmm. technically speaking, there isn't a need for, for a, or rather put it on uh, the other way, foreigners are entitled to be directors of Indonesian companies. Um, and there isn't, expressly speaking, a requirement for there to be uh, a director who is resident in Indonesia. But mm -hmm. practically speaking, what we found is that you do actually need someone um, to actually be present in Indonesia to carry out various, um, to, to basically make it for an effective business. Mm. Simply because, as I mentioned earlier, unlike in Singapore, you know, it's, it's very difficult in, in Indonesia to actually remotely manage your business from overseas. Um, you do oftentimes need to actually have uh, physical interactions in order to to get your necessary licenses and approvals mm. uh, from the government, yeah? Mm. Okay. So, moving on to this, foreign investment in Singapore. This is just an example of, of uh, quite a common structure which we encounter. Um, so, what will happen then is that um, you set up your Singapore holding company, or rather, there's a, there's a Singapore holding company um, mm. and uh, it is owned by a BVI company or it can be actually any other foreign mm. entity. Mm. Um, now, the Singapore Holco has got interests in a whole bunch of different uh, businesses mm. uh, and companies, subsidiaries throughout the region. Mm. You know, rather than for a foreign, for a purchaser to actually have to go into each uh, jurisdiction and, and um, you know, purchase the entity in each of those jurisdictions and deal with the potential difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, you just go to the very topmost level where the, where the BVI company as the shareholder will basically sh sell all its shares to the purchaser. So mm -hmm. essentially you're using the Singapore holding con company as the conduit to, to, get, um, to basically invest throughout the entire ASEAN region. Um, and the advantage of that other than the convenience is, is of course legal certainty and I'll get to that uh, further down in this presentation. Mm. So tax in Singapore, actually uh, this, is, this has been completely covered by Edmund, <laughs> so I, I don't propose to go through mm -hmm. it. Um, just to recap, a very low tax rate and also the, the, the fact that we have more than 80 double taxation agreements with numerous countries. Um, this is actually a, a very significant factor uh, because if your operating companies are in the region and they are the ones who are generating your revenue and your profits, you definitely want the presence of these DTAs to ensure that um, your, your tax efficiency is, is maximized. Okay, now moving on to dispute resolution, and uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, I think I've gone over my time quite a bit. So let no me worries. just delve into this um, no as quickly as possible, yeah? Uh, and and this, is the, this is actually the area which I would like to, to emphasize more on. Now, other than the fact that, that Singapore um, is fortunate to have a very developed um, infrastructure to facilitate investments into Singapore and to use Singapore as the hub to basically leapfrog into the region. One of the most common areas uh, which, which investors or foreign uh, entities actually ask about when they come to consult with us is basically how they can protect themselves in the event that something goes wrong with their businesses um, in the region. So, for example, if you've got a, you know, a joint venture or a partnership um, in various other countries, you know, mm. when you're discussing and, and getting into the marriage, everything is fine. Mm -hmm. But um, at the back of everybody's mind, even though it may not be expressly mentioned, but at the back of everybody's mind is always the thought that what if something goes wrong? Mm. 
So um, the advantage, I think one of the primary advantages of, of investing in Singapore is that we have a very well-developed and more importantly, a very fair and transparent dispute resolution system. Um, and this has actually been a concerted effort by the Singapore government and its Ministry of Law to mm. actually develop Singapore as a legal hub for the entire mm. ASEAN region. Mm. So to this end, other than, than having the court system, mm. um, which consists of our state courts and our, our high court and court of appeal, mm. um, we've also got very well established institutions such as the Singapore Mediation Centre, Mm. the Singapore International mm. Arbitration Centre, mm. and most recently, mm. the Singapore International Commercial Court. Mm. And, and basically, all of these institutions, their role is to basically um, be able to resolve disputes uh, without going into the court system. Mm. Yeah? Especially in the context of SIAC, I think what, what you will find, oh sorry, Singapore International Arbitration, the acronym is of course SIAC. Um, mm. What you'll find in a lot of cross-border contracts, MNAs and all that, is that the dispute resolution clause would always, or not always, sorry, uh, would very often provide for the SIAC to be the dispute resolution um, forum. Mm. And the reason for this is, is basically twofold. Number one, I think it is, it is acknowledged that the, that the arbitrators who sit on the panels of, the, of any SIAC arbitration are very well acknowledged experts and professionals in, in their respective field. So there's the comfort not only of the competence of the arbitrator, but also, I think um, the other point, which is very important for investors, is that they feel comforted that the, the arbitrators are going to be neutral and unbiased. Mm. So, um, so basically, you go into the arbitration and the dispute knowing that at the end of the day, the, the panel of arbitrators or the arbitral panel will basically adjudicate the dispute in a fair and transparent manner. Mm, yeah. Okay. Um, similarly with the SICC, but that's quite a, a new entity, so I, I won't go into it. Um, and what we found is that increasingly um, over the years, rather than to jump mm. straight into a dispute, mm. a lot of parties are actually um, asking for met up mediation arbitration. So as a first step, um, the parties will try and resolve uh, any dispute they have through mediation. And to this end, Singapore has got the Mediation Center, which basically sets out um, the infrastructure, not, not only in terms of roles, but also facilities to actually um, provide for, for a convenient venue by which parties can actually mediate their dispute. And um, it may be surprising to some of you, but the success rate in the SMC or for mediation in general is actually very high because the as I'm sure uh, all of you would, would know, um, the costs in, involved in, in a full-blown dispute resolution, be it court or arbitration, is generally um, not cheap, shall we say. So it always helps from a, from a cost perspective to try and resolve the matter through mediation rather yeah. than jumping right. straight um, yeah. into a dispute with your guns blazing. Mm. Yeah, so um, other than, than the, the legal hub, um, Singapore is also, uh, also has its reputation as a financial and educational hub, etc., etc. Now, um, the point of this, uh, this particular sentence is, is as, as Edmund mentioned earlier, yeah, uh, our employment laws in Singapore are reasonably straightforward. By and large, other than the Employment Act, um, the relationship between employee and employee is pretty much contractual in nature. Um, so, so the parties basically know what they're getting into by way of what they agree to under any employment contract. Now compare and contrast this with some other jurisdictions in the region. Um, one of the big sticking points actually is basically what happens when you need to let employees go. 
And what we found is that in some countries, I, I, I won't name names, but in, in some countries, letting go of employees is really not easy because the laws of that country are very biased towards employee protection. Mm. Um, so you have instances where, where for example, even if, if the employee um, commits uh, some fraudulent act or cheats the company, if that person refuses to, to resign or go gracefully, um, hypothetically, that person could stay on and, and needs to be paid yeah, by the company until such time as the labor court actually, actually gives its ruling that, that the company is allowed to let that person go. Um, and that could be two years later, for example. So essentially, you're paying, you could find yourself paying uh, a person who's cheated you for two years. So obviously that's a, that doesn't sit well with a lot of um, foreign investors. Okay. So the last point on that slide is uh, how to close down a corporate entity in Singapore. Um, again, perhaps a bit of a taboo subject, but the reality of the situation is that if you can set up a company, you also need to prepare yourself for the possibility that things won't go as you planned and you need to shut it down. Now in Singapore, we've got a very well um, developed system by which uh, insolvent companies, or actually solvent companies, can actually be closed down. Um, and, and that's been, and there are various changes which have been proposed to it, but by and large, the process again is very transparent um, and it doesn't require a lot of time um, to basically shut down. So you've got things like your voluntary winding up, or you can go to court to get an order for winding up. Or if you want the company to survive, um, but unfortunately it's insolvent, there are other ways of basically addressing this as well. For example, through a scheme of arrangement where basically the company will propose to its creditors a, a way of resolving its debts. Um, for example, through, through a percentage payment over a number of years. Um, and the other alternative is judicial management, mm. where basically the court will appoint a judicial manager to come in and basically take control of the company. And that is with a view to rehabilitating it such that it is able to continue as a going concern. Yeah. Plus, more importantly, perhaps, um, it will result in the creditors getting a higher return um, as compared to if the company were to go into liquidation. Um, so, so all these options are available to companies which, which want to basically close down their business okay. voluntarily or if things go wrong, then well, um, there, there are also other ways to try and save the company. So that about covers um, what I have to say. I do apologize for, for having taken up so much no time. No worries. Yeah. Um, okay, just a shameless blurb on myself, which I think we can skip. But let's go straight to the disclaimer. <laughs> okay, that, that actually um, concludes my presentation. Uh, if anybody has got any questions, uh, I think Edmund and speaking on Edmund's behalf would be happy to feel them. Yeah. So, Paul, your disclaimer is a little thing. <laughs> I, I, let, let me just end my screen and say, yeah, I'll stop the sharing. <laughs> okay, yes. Right, anyone has any questions? Right, anyone has any questions? One comment I'd like to One make. One comment I'd like to make. Okay. Sorry, Paul, I think there's an Sorry, echo. Paul, I think there's an you echo. You need to switch off one of it, Paul. switch off one of it, Paul. Okay, okay, can do. <laughs> let, me, let me reduce the volume. Yeah. Okay. No, um, one okay, thing yes. I, thanks. One thing that came out of Paul's presentation, which I'd just like to comment on very lightly, is the uh, World Bank Ease of Business Doing Report, which ranked Singapore as number two. I am aware of that report. I've actually used it in some of the marketings and, uh, and, and pitches because it has a more favorable ranking than even the TMF um, internal one. Um, uh, the GBCI, but uh, mm. people have also asked, what is the difference between that one and, and the TMF GBCI? Mm. The uh, ease of doing business, um, very favorable for score for Singapore. It's held the number two position for several years. 
Before that, it held the number one position before it was taken over by New Zealand. Um, their assessment methodology is slightly different. It also incorporates certain social political things like, uh, maybe not social political, but certain things like um, how easy is it to set up an electricity utilities account in the country? Mm. Right. And, and, and we, we focus more objectively on, on those three metrics. So the assessment is different, but obviously the direction is, is very similar. But I've used both. Um, okay. the, the GBCI for us is also sometimes a bit of a double-edged sword because mm. sometimes you want to be easier and um, less complex to mm. attract investment into the country. But sometimes you want to be seen as being complicated so that you engage specialists <laughs> such as Paul or myself to help you because <laughs> the jurisdiction is, is complicated. So, so there's kind of a balance there. Paul, you got anything to add on? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. What what Edmund said is is um, perfectly correct because the World Bank takes into consideration a whole range of factors, and and you can actually look at those factors from the World Bank side itself quite easily, you know. But but it yeah, as 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 Edmund mentioned, a specific example, things like setting up um, or ease of access to electricity and stuff like that. Um, it's something we very much take for granted, I suppose, in Singapore. Uh, but the reality is that it's, you know, for foreign investors, the, you know, it, it is, it is a critical consideration, reliability of, of your access to, to utilities and the such like. Um, but I think one thing we are, Edmund and I are definitely agreed on is that as far as this region is concerned, um, Singapore is, is by far the easiest country by which to actually set up a company. And for various reasons, it is the probably the ideal place to leapfrog um, into, into the region. Um, so again, you've got this whole um, hub and spoke approach where basically Singapore is the hub and every other, you know, you can have your operating companies throughout the region, take advantage of the tax benefits across the region, um, remittance of dividends. So actually on, the, on that point, just, just two th quick things, yeah? Um, remittance of monies is also one thing which, which perhaps um, uh, makes Singapore stand out and I'm sure Edmund can jump in on this but we've got a very well developed banking system as, as I'm sure all of you are aware and, and you know um, it's remitting money to and from Singapore is not difficult of course as long as you're not engaged in any nefarious money laundering activities and the such like um, but that situation is not necessarily the case throughout the region. Yeah, um, sometimes you'll find that that remitting monies into or out of a country may pose difficulties. You either have to get permission, or you have to um, report the the uh, the the remittance if it's above a certain amount, and oftentimes that may create administrative difficulties. Yeah. Singapore, because of its status as a financial center, it has free flow of funds and capital. But I mean, obviously within reason, there is still AML and uh, counterterrorism monitoring and, and those type of things, but it doesn't need the regulatory permissions. You don't need to apply to the state administration of foreign exchange and, for example, in another jurisdiction to, to get approval to repatriate earnings or, or anything like that. So, so companies... Um, other than, and this hub and spoke approach um, that, that Paul commented on, so because of the free flow of capital, you can use it uh, as a destination for some of your cash pooling accounts, right? Uh, if you have a, a global cash pooling system or a regional cash pooling system with, with excess funds um, in certain jurisdictions, you're keeping them in, in Singapore to, to facilitate ease and, and uh, pooling for interest deposit purposes. So, so that's a benefit of, of Singapore as well. Hmm. So, uh, so Edmund, uh, Edmund uh, sorry, can oh, I yeah, just oh, jump in first? To, yeah, oh, yes, go ahead. Sorry, that's, I, it just occurred to me that I missed out a very important point regarding dispute resolution. Um, and that is uh, enforcement of judgments or enforcement of awards. Um, mm. So, I, 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 t I mentioned briefly about, about Singapore being the legal hub um, and I paid particular attention to arbitration. 
Now, the, the advantage to that, other than the intrinsic advantage of the transparency and professionalism of the arbitration process um, in Singapore, is that, of course, at the end of the um, process, you get an award from the tribunal. Mm. Um, and there should not be a problem in enforcing that award uh, throughout the region. Yeah, I say should not, because practically speaking, we have encountered instances where, uh, where basically the court system or the system itself may not be, shall we say, um, overly receptive to mm. helping foreign parties to enforce an arbitral award. But legally speaking, you are entitled to. So, so for those of you who are concerned mm. about, about um, what if things go wrong and are we able to, to mm. you know, basically... Uh, resolve our dispute properly. So you, you can use Singapore as a dispute resolution forum, not only to resolve the dispute, but also moving on. As far as enforcement is concerned, um, it shouldn't be a problem. So of course, the upside to that is that you don't actually then need to go to the court of um, whatever country it is to actually have, have that dispute resolved. Yeah, that, that's basically what, what I wanted to add on. Good point, good point. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to ask uh, Edmund is that uh, I think uh, basically right now Singapore has already been hosting a lot of big MNC, uh, right? So what a common uh, uh, common uh, when you you set up for uh, either startups or MNCs, what are common issues that uh, in the beginning part when they come in to, uh, uh, that they usually face uh, or they will ask Edmund, what's your advice on this? What are the common questions? Mm, I mean, this, the stuff they ask about the procedures and filings, but, but yep. to be honest, it is very easy to, 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 easy? to set up here. Well, re relatively relatively <laughs> speaking, if, if comparing okay. to, to some good. of the uh, other markets in, in, mm. in ASEAN. Um, people do ask about the employment laws. Um, uh, that has been an interest. Um, certain new entrants into the market, they've also been asking about these, these COVID support schemes and, and, and their entitlements to them. Um, but uh, most of those schemes, it's, they were for people that were already in the market and they were based upon positions in, in January or March. So, so future entitlements and other things like, like if you set up tomorrow, you, you, you may not be able to get those right. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that because we're still going through this, there's going to be other subsidies or, or incentives or, or support schemes that's going to be released by the government. Right. You think um, so? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, let's see how th this uh, election on Friday. Election. So, so, so <laughs> okay. I'm pretty sure there's going to be something coming out after that. Um, okay. All right, thank cool. you. Thank you for that, Edwin. All right, Paul, uh, how about uh, yourself? Do you have any specific case examples that you would like to share on the uh, Singapore Springboard into the region? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe just a very quick uh, case example. I can't name the names for obvious reasons. Mm. Um, but essentially what happened was, was that a, a very lovely English couple came to look for me. Um, and they took out this two page long document in English. Mm. And basically they sat down and said, we've, we've bought a resort in, in XYZ country. Oh, okay, I can name it actually. We've bought a resort in Indonesia. Okay. Could you let us know whether this two page long document helps us or protects us? <laughs> so I, I had a look at it and basically it was a loan agreement where they had lent money to an, in, uh, an individual in Indonesia. Okay. Um, and on the face of that two page long document, they felt mm. that they were legally protected, which of course they were not because number one, any competently drafted loan agreement is not going to be two pages long. Number two, um, uh, as Edmund alluded to earlier, Indonesia is a country where there are local language requirements. So oh, a contract in yeah. English Correct. is not valid. Yeah? So in fact, I the court there has basically... So I owe you doesn't matter anymore, right? <laughs> I owe you. No, I mean, basically <laughs> any agreement entered into with an Indonesian entity or person needs to be in Bahasa Indonesia. Okay. Otherwise, it is void. 
Um, and the third point uh, is is basically that nominee structures are illegal in Indonesia. Yeah. So what a lot of foreigners try to do, regrettably, to try and get around the minimum capital requirements, is to basically engage an Indonesian nominee as the shareholder. Um, I need to emphasize that under Indonesian law, the, the company's law, this is illegal. The entire transaction is void. Yeah. So anyway, going back to this lovely English couple, so they came to me, I had a two minute look at it and basically said, um, you have no protection whatsoever. So, so we engaged on an exercise of um, basically helping them to restructure it. And, and the relevance of this case example is that the eventual structure which we came up with was to, for them to set up a Singapore holding company. Now, quite apart from all the advantages of setting up the company in Singapore, which we've already discussed through this, this webinar, um, there was an ancillary benefit, which is that under Indonesia's negative investment list, um, there are certain concessions granted to foreign companies in the ASEAN region. They are entitled to a higher foreign ownership in the Indonesian company as compared to non-ASEAN entities. Mm. So um, from a foreign investor's perspective, uh, I think the general rule is that you, you would prefer to get as high a, a shareholding in the Indonesian entity as you would like. So we, we set up the Singapore whole code um, using the express uh, benefit under Indonesia's uh, investment list they were then able to hold 70% uh, of the resort business in Indonesia, which is, of course, a majority which helps them to basically um, take almost complete control of the company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so there are, and, and we also, after having done this entire exercise, um, we, we also then came to the, the, the clients rather, came to the realization that it was a lot easier for them to actually. Um, uh, use Singapore as the financial hub to basically help to transfer, um, you know, the, the profits and revenue from the Indonesian opco back to their home country and conversely for them to fund um, the Indonesian resort through Singapore. So um, all in all, I think it was a, it was a very happy win-win situation for, for all the parties involved. Oh, that's good. That's good advisory. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, how about the rest? Are any last questions that we can before we end the meeting? No? All right. So thank you, Edmund and Paul, for your sharing today. Uh, it's uh, an honor to be able to actually invite both of you to come and can just speak to us. Uh, and think uh, your slides is insightful. I think I do grab a lot of tips from there. So any issues, I will still, I think I will be coming to both of you as an advisor for sure. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. We look forward to welcoming you to Singapore. Go Singapore. Um, Are we'll, you running we'll... an election? <laughs> no, I'm, I, I, I may need to apply for a PR soon, so, I'm, so hopefully I can attach this recording. Okay, okay. All right. But, thank, um, you. Hmm. thank you very much. And, and, and I'll, thank I'll you share everyone. those materials with, with, you, with Talent Viz and they can distribute them to you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank right, you. Paul. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe. Bye bye. Take, take care. care. Happy voting this Friday if you are Singaporean. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.